Everybody, um, it's a pleasure to be here today, here in Sao Paulo at the campus party. Uh, it's the first time I've been here at the campus party, but not the first time in Sao Paulo. Uh, my name is David Garpenstahl, and I come all the way from Sweden up north to come here in this heat to talk about the Nordic gaming industry. And uh, there are two things, two takeaways, as you say, that I want you to get from this very brief overview. It will be very quick. I will try not to talk too quickly, uh, to not give uh, Texas in there too much problems. But two takeaways. Uh, the Nordic gaming industry is uh, one of the most cutting edge industries right now. It's growing uh, enormously and expansive. Um, and uh, that's a, a takeaway. I believe that uh, the Nordic gaming industry can serve as a role model uh, and also as an inspiration for uh, countries like uh, Brazil, for instance. Uh, and the second takeaway, uh, if you haven't heard it already, the gaming industry is soon to pass 100 billion US dollars per year. So it's definitely a future industry. Uh, I think it's a golden opportunity for anybody that wants to pursue a career uh, in this. So it's a good opportunity for you, but also for Brazil. So that would be uh, the two main takeaways from this talk. Um, and. Uh, Usually I say it's okay to ask questions at any time, but uh, maybe for language reasons, maybe we should uh, take it at the end, but uh, I have a translator that can help with it. So uh, let's see how it goes. My talk today is divided into uh, four different areas. First, I will very, very briefly just uh, mention a little bit about my background and also start uh, zooming in on uh, the Nordic countries and Sweden and give you a little bit of, a, uh, I would say, context of uh, what Sweden is and what Sweden isn't. Uh, then I will give you an overview uh, of the gaming industry and also point out certain aspects of the industry where I talk about disruptive change. I try to explain a little bit this buzzword of disruptive change, what it actually means in reality and why it gives you uh, such an extraordinary opportunity also to join this, uh, which leads uh, into the third segment of the talk, which is why you should in my opinion, uh, pursue a career in the gaming industry. Maybe uh, most of you that are here, maybe there's a reason why you choose to come here, because you, you will or you already started to pursue a career. And then, very nicely, I will wrap it, out, wrap it up with a little bit of uh, trend watching to spot where the industry is going, not only in the Nordics, but what's also the potential for uh, Brazil and for you. I will, uh, to get you warmed up a little bit, uh, start, start a little bit casually to present my first love and passion in life, uh, the Atari. And I know also that uh, it uh, came to Brazil here uh, in the beginning of the 1980s. Uh, uh, this was something in the summer of uh, 1979, you can probably recognize, well, at least you should, I think, is Pac-Man on the screen. Uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time uh, doing that and it would also affect uh, my choice of career. This game also had a tremendous impact on me and I think it's worth spending a couple of seconds just uh, thinking about the enormous uh, change this industry has done uh, in three, four decades. At this time it was basically just moving uh, big pixels around the screen and today we talk about an industry that has a capacity of rendering photorealistic in, uh, virtual worlds in real time. I mean it's a a tremendous change, very, very fascinating. Uh, and when you're as old as I am, uh, you have the golden opportunity to, to actually have, I remember, as I said, even Pong when it came out. So that's how old I am. Um, just very quickly, a little bit of my background. I've been an entrepreneur for more than 20 years, uh, basically spending time in two industries, uh, both of them very much towards the entertainment side of things in life. One is the music industry and the other one is, of course, somewhere the bordering line between gaming, online worlds, technology and also entertainment. Uh, one of the more famous ones are DreamHack in Sweden, but also uh, building online sites, working with esports, etc. Uh, also been for many years involved in uh, the biggest uh, gaming center, which is, which is like a, more of a stationary uh, uh, LAN party, if you so want, uh, more than 400 uh, PCs, high-end gaming computers in central Stockholm. Uh, also something that pertains to Brazil. I don't know if uh, it would have been fun to meet somebody, but this was a site that we launched uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, it was very, oh, you can hardly see it, but uh, it was done in ASCII and very, very cult. It was called So Gamed, 
and we also launched a, a Brazilian version here uh, in Brazil um, that, uh, as far as I was told, was the biggest gaming site here uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, so I have a very strong uh, bond because also the head developer of Soul Gamed, uh, he, was, uh, he is Brazilian and he lives here in Sao Paulo, a good friend of mine. Uh, just last to tie up uh, my background, also spending time building, uh, uh, developing uh, infrastructures and technology, etc. Uh, we started to, to col collaborate and work with um, uh, EA in 2006, and we used some of the core technology we, that we developed for, I mean, inspired from So Gamed and other online activities that we did, that be became later uh, a central part of the battlefield that DICE did, which is today called Battle Log. Uh, so it's also a very central um, uh, part of uh, Battlefield 4 and forward. And this led to, instead of uh, licensing the technology, uh, EA decided to buy the company, and we made an exit in 2012. So that was that. So where the hell is Sweden? If you take the globe and you look and you go way up north in the northern parts, when you start getting on the outskirts of civilization, worryingly close to Greenland and other places, you find the kingdom of Sweden. And from the left and to the right, you have the Nordic countries. I just want to tell you, when I talk about the Nordics, it's uh, from the left. Iceland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden in the middle, and uh, Finland. Uh, of course, uh, and um, I'm curious to know, uh, it's, it's kind of funny when it comes to Sweden, there's a lot of myths about Sweden, uh, especially the fact that you have the Arctic Circle up there, uh, which makes it uh, very, very cold. And I was wondering if there's anybody, when I say Sweden, does that ring any bells? You know anything about Sweden? Yes? Abba, that's a good one. And oh yes, oh yes. Some people say girls, but uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, you can say a lot of things, but definitely one thing that uh, Sweden is associ associated about is, of course, is the home of Santa Claus. You should know that. And we have a classic argument in the Nordics between Finland and Sweden. And I can uh, today reveal here at the campus party that it's definitely Sweden is uh, the home of uh, Santa Claus. Uh, also due to the fact that we're very close to the... Uh, Polar region is very cold in Sweden. Another myth is, of course, that we have uh, polar bears walking the streets uh, of Stockholm, and I can say this is not true. It's definitely not true. And um, I uh, uh, took the opportunity before I left Stockholm to make a short little clip of showing exactly. It's been uh, uh, actually minus 45 Celsius in the northern parts of uh, Sweden, so we made a short little clip to show the weather conditions in Sweden right now. So I hope you will see uh, something uh, on the screen. Should be a little bit more sound. <laughs> yeah, okay, the sound came too late. But anyways, uh, you can imagine, of course, that when George Lucas decided to uh, shoot the uh, Hoth scenes in the beginning of Empire Strikes Back, uh, he chose not very far from Stockholm, actually inside of uh, Norway, uh, they shot the scenery for the ice planet Hoth. So I think it's very fittingly that the new Star Wars game is being produced in central Stockholm uh, coming up. Uh, just to round up the talk about Sweden, there's actually a connection between uh, Brazil uh, and Sweden, which I think is fascinating, our beloved queen, I mentioned with monarchy. Uh, she, uh, her mother is uh, Brazilian, she was actually uh, born here in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, and later came together with the queen to uh, Sweden, and she passed away there. Uh, so, you mentioned ABBA, that's correct, uh, but also when you come to Brazil, I think it's fittingly to say one of the best uh, soccer players coming from Sweden, Slatan. Uh, we have other things, IKEA, of course, richer than Bill Gates, the founder of IKEA. You talked about Booth. Absolute vodka, but uh, more on the serious side, moving away from myths uh, and uh, other uh, things. Sweden have a very long tradition. I kind of wanted to mention a little bit to, to try to explain also why uh, the Nordic countries are doing so well in the gaming industry. It's because we have a very long tradition of entrepreneurship and innovation uh, dating every way back to Alfred Nobel inventing. And we like to blow things up in Sweden, so uh, he came up with dynamite, uh, which you will see later. Uh, we have very good 
companies that like to blow things up virtually, uh, but also very classical high technology industrial companies like Ericsson uh, that laid a foundation for telecommunication and also mobile phones, uh, etc. But also industrial companies like ABB that do robotics, etc. This has created very importantly uh, 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 an ecosystem of talent and technology uh, and uh, money uh, etc which also has uh, I think paid a wave for um, parts of the new technology new high-tech companies uh, Spotify is Swedish uh, and also companies like Skype uh, coming out of uh, Sweden it's owned by Microsoft today needless to say and this of course led to companies like Dice uh, doing the Battlefield series uh, doing also uh, uh, the new uh, Star Wars and uh, Mirror's Edge 2. Uh, maybe you're familiar also with this uh, game called uh, Minecraft. It's produced by this uh, extraordinary, uh, crazy success story, Mojang. But other uh, companies also like Paradox uh, and Massive Entertainment are part of uh, what I should say, the uh, expansive and also new part of uh, the Swedish gaming industry. Uh, and it's hard to not talk about the noted game industry to mention uh, Minecraft which is such a huge uh, uh, <laughs> success. Uh, they just have a turnover of 250, almost 250 US dollars last year uh, with this game. And bear in mind that it's only 28 people working in the company, which means that they do like 10 million US dollars per employee. It's like almost unheard of. Uh, and I'm sure that you are familiar with this game coming out of Finland. You probably never missed it, uh, this, the Angry Birds. Uh, the number one uh, application of all times downloaded in the App Store. Uh, this was not an overnight success for, for the guys uh, behind Rovio. This was uh, uh, Angry Birds were the 57th uh, company that they, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 57th game that they did uh, for mobile. So it, was, it, it took uh, quite some time, but uh, what a success. Uh, what a success. Uh, before I proceed uh, and give you a little bit of it, uh, uh, discussion about um, this uh, disruptive changes that I was talking about in the Nordic industry. I just briefly want to mention some of the companies. Uh, Massive Entertainment is uh, located in the southern parts uh, of uh, Sweden uh, and they've been hiring quite a lot of uh, people lately because they're involved in producing uh, Tom Clancy's uh, uh, new game in, in the Tom Clancy universe uh, which is called The Division uh, which is a uh, one of the most uh, anticipated uh, games next year. And they also uh, produce uh, a very, very impressive graphical engine, which I, I think showcase uh, a lot of this high-tech uh, tradition that we have in Sweden. Uh, and I'm going to show you a, a clip from uh, the vision. And uh, it's, uh, I would like to say that uh, it's, it's not, I, I don't think it's very visible here, unfortunately, when I play it. But if you have a chance, do check it up uh, on high resolution uh, on any screen and really be uh, fascinated about it. So this clip has uh, sound, uh, and let's see if we can actually Peggy 18. see something. And you can rest your ears a little bit. Fittingly, the engine is called Snowdrop. The setting of the game is taking place in uh, New York. And I will talk a little bit in the intro before we show a little bit of the gameplay. Uh, is that this is truly, I would say, uh, a very significant uh, and a good uh, example of what the next generation uh, of uh, uh, gaming technology will provide uh, where they have very very uh, everything when you uh, talk about the engine is dynamic this dynamic that it has dynamic uh, daylight systems so once you play it it changes along uh, it also has a, a dynamic weather system uh, and uh, also uh, even the snow uh, could all, all of a sudden start melting or it, uh, the temperature changes uh, etc I will show you a little bit to hear uh, actual gameplay I hope you see something. And I think that they uh, put in a lot of effort into uh, finding I uh, very interesting uh, game modes. Uh, is that me? So you'll see when he walks down the street. 
And this is uh, the multiplayer uh, when you're doing different missions. Um, civilians on the left. There on the right side. Uh, it has so many different details, and the particle uh, system is very uh, impressive. Yeah, the intersection's clear. There's some like construction site here on the left. Some of the things that this uh, generation of engines also uh, uh, offer is what's called we come back later. procedural the destruction. Confirmed. That's when you can uh, blow things up piece by piece. The game also offers uh, pretty cool stuff in terms of what's called a companion mode that anybody can play for free on a smartphone right, or a tablet and you can join up uh, and support uh, the people in the game with power-ups and different things. Uh, wow, yep. I'm gonna have a uh, I'm gonna go in. shootout. Okay. I've got my group heal loaded, so if you guys want to check your skills and switch it up, you can. I think it's pretty nifty uh, user interface also. I'm gonna pull them out. Are you guys ready? Yeah, I'm good. Let's do it. Get some action now. Alright, I'm coming out, coming out. Two on the left, uh, one on the right. Okay, two more on the right. Oh yeah, I see him. Ooh, they threw a Molotov, look out. Good call, thank you. Well, you see how it can also interact with the, the I think it's so cool when it shows the board. Here it comes, uh, now zooming in oh, here, uh, somebody in companion mode, you can see on the top of the screen, I can support the guy, so then he can move on and can help with other things. He could uh, very well be on a smartphone or something like that. So you see the procedural destruction, how things uh, deteriorate when you shoot, which is pretty cool stuff. Oh, you see the guy on the roof? Yeah, oh, there he is, okay. But uh, I can definitely recommend, if you haven't seen this, really check it out, uh, high resolution, uh, it's very impressive. And I think this is also uh, showcasing also that the Swedish industry is more and more having the capacity to develop core technology uh, that will be used uh, for other games internationally, etc. Uh, so I'm coming out to the second part. Uh, going a little bit more into into uh, sorry <laughs> uh, the details uh, of uh, the industry uh, and uh, I talked uh, initially about why I think there's uh, so much opportunity in the gaming industry also not only that is growing but the rules of the game literally is changing I mean the past let's say six to eight years the gaming industry in terms of business models, how things uh, games are being made, how they're produced, etc. And the cost of producing games has changed the industry profoundly, leaving companies, uh, giants like Nintendo struggling. I'm sure that you haven't missed lately uh, the problems that Nintendo has. And, uh, 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 and the interesting thing also with uh, the, the social revolution of uh, the gaming, but also the mobile segment has been very positive for the Nordic countries for reasons that I said with companies like Ericsson or Nokia or something that have been building a foundation of like a Silicon Valley in the, in the Nordics and in Sweden. Uh, the biggest changes, in my opinion, is still ahead. Even though that the gaming industry has changed profoundly, it will change even more and even more rapidly. And um, it gives, uh, I think, a very interesting uh, overview of the mechanics in the industry to, to look at uh, of what, uh, ah, anyways, uh, an industry that usually came in the left column, you see that it had basically one business model, which was to ship 
uh, a CD, uh, and today it has changed. Many, many different platforms. It's not only an underground culture uh, with just guys playing. I mean, it's everybody playing. Uh, and last time I counted, we talk about an industry that has gone from one business model to 29, 30 different uh, uh, ways of monetizing and making business on gaming. I don't think we need to talk much about this one, but this is also a way of describing uh, different kinds of players, uh, etc. But one uh, also another good way of looking and explaining the changes in the gaming industry and why they're disruptive and why uh, things have changed so much in the Swedish uh, gaming industry, the, the Nordic gaming industry, but why I also think uh, there's a lot of opportunity in Brazil. Uh, one of the best ways of looking at any industry is to see how the value change, which means in the gaming industry you have at one end you have the publishers and the game uh, developers, and then you have a number of steps in the traditional models. You had the distribution, the hardware, and then at the other end, of course, you had the gamers and the players. And when you uh, look at these changes in the industry, uh, you can see that each and every step of the value chain is changing. I mean, look at, for instance, in terms of tools. This used to be an industry that many that you needed so much resources to start building games, uh, but today, thanks to companies like Unity, for instance, many, many small uh, startups can for free start developing uh, quite, uh, I would say, advanced tools. Uh, also, uh, it starts opening up new segments, and I would say very much not only the, the mobile revolution, but also the uh, internet revolution per se has been part of changing the dynamics. And so you have new segments opening up in between uh, where I spent a lot of my uh, career building add-on added value services to already established. I mean, that's how we built uh, uh, the basis for what later became a Battlelog, which was basically building things for already existing games. Uh, so you have it in that segment, for instance. Um, another way, just quickly, uh, I won't bore you too much with statistics and data, but I think it's, it's very significant if you look at more of what I call the traditional, the big dragons, the distributors, the ones that used to have a kind of dominating the industry and see that they, just the past three, four years, they lost 60% of their revenue. It's been described in Swedish corners, but it really doesn't matter because it speaks a clear language uh, that you see in the right-hand corner uh, that the Barry Sala, for instance, that distributing Nintendo, they lost 72%. Uh, they went from 50 employees to 18. Uh, Pan Vichun down here is uh, bleeding uh, and there are only 13 employees left and I think it's not long time uh, before they also are out of business. And this cannot be explained. Typically you can say, okay, but it's because we've been going through uh, the change of the platforms, we've been waiting for the new Xbox or PlayStation 4, etc. Or it's a, it's a post uh, chill in the economy because we had problems in 2008. But then bear in mind that you cannot explain these rapid changes. And because if you look at the business overall, it has been growing with 120%. So of course, given uh, established uh, uh, actors in the industry should of course have grown too. But no, with, with the, this is what I mean with the, that the rules are changing. There's opportunity for new companies basically coming from nowhere, uh, for, I mean from nowhere, and they can make a difference, start producing games cheaply, come out and, and uh, take big part uh, of the money being made because the industry is just growing. Uh, another way of looking at this is at the bottom, you see uh, as late just a few years ago, in 2011, you saw primarily companies uh, like Avalanche or Starbreeze or whatever. That's been part a long time, traditionally PC manufacturing games or consoles. Uh, and then you fast forward uh, just a, a couple of years and you see that something is happening up here. Uh, literally out of nowhere uh, came this developer, Muyang, basically starting with uh, Minecraft uh, and uh, a tremendous, like I said, from zero in turnover, and in two years they made 250 million US dollars in turnover. Of course, that's in a way a, a very extreme case, but it's an indie developer. It also shows that it's possible with very limited resources to make a difference and make a change. And the thing is also that success breeds success. And once you hit the wall, 
uh, I'm sure that Moyang as a company not only works as an inspiration for people like you to show that it's actually possible that you don't need to uh, choose a career in a big corporation and work for 20 years or, or something, but you can go after your dreams, you can work on your skills uh, and, and develop amazing games. Uh, and I won't spend too much time talking about other companies because I think it's imperative that we move on. Um, but before I go into a little bit more explaining uh, the benefits of these careers and the opportunity, I will also just quickly uh, show you another uh, a game. Peggy 18. Very, very quickly. Uh, Sweden is also in the Nordics known for Vikings, so why not produce a game with Vikings? Check this game out. a technical break there. Uh, this game is uh, produced uh, by Paradox, which is uh, sitting in central Stockholm. Uh, and is also, I think, interesting enough because they found a niche in the market. Uh, they very much focus on strategic game, but they pretty much created a niche on their own, which is called historical grand strategy games. So if you are really into those kind of things, I think you definitely should check out their catalog of games that they do. They have also, they work very closely uh, with their community and modders uh, and uh, changing their games. They have very active users, a user base of more than 400,000 uh, gamers and modders and people that are very interested in their games. So I think they also show a kind of a way, they're very expansive uh, uh, paradox games. Moving on now, uh, I spent some time before coming here because I wanted to give you uh, a little bit of recommendations, some tips, and I talked also with some uh, of the, the leading people uh, within these companies to give uh, what they think is also good recommendations of if you want to break into the industry. Uh, I guess a lot of you are right now in the university, maybe already pursuing a career in the gaming or thinking that you have uh, coder skills, developer skills, whatever. Please remember that uh, the gaming industry is a very attractive alter alternative. I mean, if you are into uh, uh, coding, for instance, front-end system, back-end system, infrastructures or artificial intelligence, whatever, these are skill sets definitely needed uh, in the gaming industry. Um, so, with this, uh, if you're still thinking about it, I think you should stop thinking about it because uh, definitely uh, there's a great opportunity there. Uh, one of the aspects that you should think about, of course, when considering any career strategically is, of course, looking at any industry and see that if there's potential of growth. Uh, and I have talked about the growth and also will come back in the end of the growth. So to kind of try to, uh, 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 when you're confronted with these questions, to find a road ahead, uh, like I said, I put together some tips and recommendations. So hopefully, um, you will bring with you at least uh, 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 some food for thought to think about. And also, always when, you, uh, when I talk with people, whether if it's entrepreneurs or developers, or whatever, uh, of career choices, if they should do it, I always come back to uh, aspects within yourself, of course. I mean, if you would want to go into uh, the gaming industry, of course, you need to have a passion for uh, uh, the talent that you have and the things that you're doing because it's a very also remember uh, an industry that's very high competitive and you really have to be passionate about the work that you're doing because otherwise it's just a it's, it's just not a regular nine to five job so I think it's very central but you already know that because that's why uh, you are at campus party in this what I call a dream factory right and Confronted also with considering the skill set and uh, if you either you're already in the university and you are studying computer science or you have a strong background in mathematics, uh, etc. I think it's interesting to look at the opportunities that either uh, you can have a formal education uh, in Sweden or the Nordic countries, for instance, we have a very good eco ecosystem. So it's possible today to have very advanced post university uh, opportunities 
to study uh, these type of works or uh, graphical engines, e etc., and learn the necess ne necessities uh, of uh, building a hopefully a successful career in the gaming industry. But still, even though that, especially if you want to work with AAA, these high budget games uh, like Battlefield, etc., you usually need to have very, very uh, advanced skills. Uh, and I think a formal education is very, very good. But don't despair uh, if you don't have the resources or the time or the possibility uh, to go into the university. There is uh, still to have what's called infor informal education, basically being self-taught. And those different uh, uh, ways of uh, uh, acquiring uh, the skills that you need gives you different opportunities. I mean, the benefits of uh, choosing a uh, more traditional or a formal education, of course, is that while you're getting your education, uh, you're already, and these are two uh, central components that I think you should always focus about when you're uh, starting to uh, gather examples. So, of course, your portfolio, and it doesn't only pertain to uh, uh, designers, graphics, but uh, as well as uh, coders. Let me come back to that. But also uh, the question about, um, I'm sorry, internship. So, for instance, when you're in a, a, a university, and I know that there are coming some gaming education here in Brazil, but I, as far as I can understand, it's very much just in the beginning. Uh, but you can also uh, consider the fact of studying also abroad if you need to uh, acquire uh, those uh, skills. But the good thing, of course, to study is that you do it together with others. You're in an affinity space, as it's called. You get already in a structured form to learn teamwork, uh, to speak in front of people, right? Learn to communicate, uh, to give and to uh, receive uh, constructive criticism. Uh, and also building your portfolio, you get while you are doing your education, you structurally uh, get to do work with uh, creating uh, projects on your own and in teams, which gives you, in my opinion, a head start once you start looking for jobs within the industry. But also, in Sweden, we have very good... Uh, uh, education system for that, that they also, with the, uh, together with the industry, because that's part of the ECHO uh, system, is that getting an internship at some of these top-end studios or other studios, uh, your education can help doing that, and you can get an internship while you're doing your education. All of these things, of course, are possible to do on your own, but I think you need to be a little bit more self-disciplined uh, and building your portfolio. You can do at places like Campus Party, for instance, uh, but also uh, joining uh, modding groups or uh, creating uh, your uh, projects online yourself or joining open source thing uh, uh, projects to build examples. And I think also something that we uh, come back to, I would like to draw a, a parallel to another creative industry. Let's, uh, for the sake of argument, say that you're a musician. Okay, your skill set, if you can only play heavy metal or rock and roll or whatever, that will limit your opportunity as a freelancer or working at a studio that you can only do very narrow things. So uh, a recommendation is that uh, you make sure that you have a, a, a good base, a good foundation, a general knowledge, uh, so you can do a lot of different things within your discipline. Uh, basically being all around. Another thing that we talk about, of course, as a lot of different careers, is that it doesn't matter if you're a, a, a coder or if you're working in the sound department uh, or other places within uh, a gaming company. You need to have good communication skills, which is called interpersonal communication. Verbally, talking with your peers, but also in writing. It's extremely important that you can describe your ideas in writing uh, and also defend them, of course, and uh, uh, receive everything. So com communication is skill. Also, uh, for you here in Brazil, remember that we now are in a global marketplace. So uh, what will definitely increase your opportunities of landing a fabulous career in the gaming industry is, of course, to be very good in the international language, pr preferably English, which gives you an opportunity to work globally. If you look at the... Uh, the Nordic game developers, the strengths that we have is that people are coming to uh, the Nordic companies. They're being drafted. Uh, if you look at Massive or DICE, they have uh, people from over 30 different nationalities. So I hope to see some of your Brazilian developers, if you can stand the cold, uh, 
come to Sweden or the Nordic countries to work. Uh, so English is very, very good. Uh, as with anything, it takes a lot of time to hone, uh, I mean, to uh, develop your skills. It takes practice, practice, practice. It takes many years, so you need to have patience, and that's where the passion comes in. So you stick to it. Uh, patience is a virtue, as they say. Another thing which might sound as a cliche, but it's still, I want to stress this, uh, to break into uh, the game in the industry, uh, as in many other places, networking is extremely important. Because while you're networking, that's where you build your contacts. You need to get out of your uh, dormitory or, or your cellar or wherever you're hanging out by yourself or with your friends to meet people, talk with people, game developers, come to places like Campus Party, uh, go to game expos, um, seminars, anything that happens industry-wise to meet other developers, but also meet recruiters. I mean, uh, I was told that I think already now in Brazil there's, uh, I hope the number is correct, but around 125 different developers. They're also recruiting. Uh, so that gives you an opportunity to uh, get what I call the foot into the door uh, and get to know people inside, but also showcase your portfolio. Another very important aspect is when you start looking for the job is also the job interview because once you find your dream jobs and you start, you have a portfolio with great stuff that will just blow people away and you start sending it and you do actually get called to a job interview. That's good news because that means that they're interested in what you're doing. But I think also to not only to uh, you know, comb your hair and put your best suit on or whatever it is, uh, you need to prepare yourself. And good advice usually is also to do a lot of research about the studio, read a lot of interviews with key people working in the studio, uh, playing their games, of course, uh, is very important. But uh, I think there's a, unfortunately a lot of uh, prospectees coming into the companies that haven't played the games and it doesn't make a very good impression. You need to have an opinion about the game so you can uh, have a very good conversation about what you think is the good aspects. Maybe you see Im improvements etc. So uh, preparation is key to really know what you're talking about. Uh, another way of course if you want to pursue an international career there are lots of uh, I mean not only that you can go into the studios on a regular basis under the job section they always list what they work uh, I mean what they look for but uh, uh, you're probably aware of also that online is a great resource develop for instance is a very good uh, site where you can go to that uh, internationally that they're looking for developers. A uh, lot of the Nordic uh, game developers are looking, they're posting their jobs there so you can see a chance and then you can provide your portfolio and hopefully come to Stockholm uh, or something for a job interview. To take a little bit uh, pause, to let your ears, uh, we look a little bit closer at the dice. Also, I want to show uh, a little clip so you can uh, admire the craftsmanship of uh, Battlefield. But a very interesting aspect that came up uh, when I was doing a little bit of updating the research of the industry was that uh, DICE actually were formed by uh, four friends that were in the demo scene. And I know that uh, places like Campus Party or uh, LAN parties around the world, they usually have a demo scene, right? So that's how they created demos. Uh, and then they went on to uh, form DICE. They made uh, something called pinball, dr pin pin pinball Dreams. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, that's uh, where we play pinball on a PC. And uh, then it just took off. And uh, if you look at the uh, Rovio, it's also a very interesting parallel uh, to what, why I think it's extremely important of what's going on here at Campus Party and why it's such a tremendous opportunity for you, uh, you people to be here is that uh, the Rovio guys, remember the guys with the Angry Birds, right? They were uh, at the place, uh, at a demo scene, a LAN party in uh, Helsinki, it's called the Assembly. You may, may or may not have heard about it, but it's a very famous one. They were participating in the demo tournaments and they won there and that was kind of the start for them going into business themselves. So a lot of startups and a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for you to kind of start creating your startups here, exist here at Campus Party. So. Take a brief moment here before I start to round up the future prospects for Brazil and for you. Uh, let's have a look at Battlefield 4. And mind you, when you look at this, 
I'm a Star Wars fanatic, and I just can't. This uh, 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 very fittingly, the graphic engine that uh, the third generation that Dice has developed is, of course, called Frostbite. Another pun uh, of the Nordics, uh, but also it will serve the foundation of Battlefront anew. So imagine this huge, uh, dynamic, interactive scenes that we will see, and actually seeing that also. Battlefield 4, of course, uh, on its own merits, is very, very impressive. This uh, clip was uh, recorded in 60 frames per second. It's uh, 600 megabytes. Uh, but uh, once again, check it out on the high-end system. It's fucking amazing. Perfect. And here the uh, graphical engine also, of course, supports uh, the waves that you see when you're in multiplayer mode. The waves are exactly the same for everybody playing in the game. So that creates a very unique opportunity. And uh, destruction would like to blow things up in Sweden. As I Way to see uh, doing things uh, blowing up stormtroopers and other things like this. Destruction, destruction, destruction. Um, of course, please remember that uh, Nordic games and Swedish games are not only about blowing things up, but uh, unfortunately, it is a very good example of demonstrating uh, uh, the technology of these graphical engines. Uh, but uh, we have lots of <laughs> other games coming out too. So the uh, uh, Battlefront, the Star Wars games, is going to come out, as DICE say, when it's ready but hopefully it's going to be during 2015. So, thank you for your patience and that you're sticking around uh, before hopefully you will have some questions for me, but rounding things up now, uh, once again, why, why I try to pers persuade you, if you're already not too persuaded, uh, uh, why this is a, a future uh, work for you, uh, and why I think also that the Nordic region, and I will also come to the fact why I think Brazil has an opportunity, is that due to historical facts, but also that uh, for reasons that the Nordic game developers have done very well, is that we have come to a point where we can keep what I call is the competitive edge. Some regions of the world, they have had what's called a brain drain. That is when developers are educated, they've been schooled, they've been trained, they've been working on some games, they've been recruited and they move to California or they move to Quebec in Canada. Or, but it has turned now for Sweden because we had a brain drain for a lot of time, but for many different reasons, a lot of people, despite the cold, <laughs> are coming to Sweden and we have very work, good work conditions, etc. So the competitive edge and fighting for the global talent is very good. Uh, so that's very important. And when I look into the future, uh, and when I've analyzed the past six years, we have had 600% growth of the gaming industry in the Nordics. And, when, and we, if we take that same uh, time frame, the next six years, my hope is that I will come back here together with some of you from Stockholm and tell of the extraordinary opportunity, I mean, uh, <laughs> change that has been made in the development in 20, uh, 2020, we can stand here together on the stage talking about, and my prediction is, is that uh, the, the industry in the Nordics has doubled. Today, the industry is roughly 5,200, 5,500, if you look at the changes already, uh, because uh, the latest statistics is not out yet, uh, but I think my guesstimate for 2013 is that we're already 6,700 developers in the Nordic region. Uh, 
is roughly 500 companies right now. But in six years, it will double. Thanks very much to what's happening in uh, uh, Finland. Mind you that already that the Nordic region is the second biggest region of development in the uh, UK right now. Uh, I'm sorry, in Europe. UK is number one, and uh, the UK is actually shrinking because they are not as strong in the mobile segment or online segment. Uh, so they're kind of shrinking a little bit. My, but with, if my prediction is all right, and with the help of you guys also coming up, uh, Sweden will actually, in six years, I mean, uh, the Nordic region, uh, be the number one region. And why I talk about the Nordic region and not just talk about Sweden is because, come on, there's hardly any people living up there. Sweden, with its very vast space, it's the third biggest area uh, in Europe, but it's only 10 million people, right? In the capital of uh, Sweden, it's only 1 million. Uh, compared to Sao Paulo, that's like a joke because, you know, there's like 20 million, 30 million in the bigger parts uh, of uh, Sao Paulo, which is uh, over what uh, you have in the whole Nordics. Uh, so that's why we like to we stick together in the Nordics, right? So that's why we always talk about the Nordic region. But is it more fair? Uh, because culturally, we're also very close uh, and economically as well. So this definitely gives a huge potential for the growth that I talked about, but something which is also uh, very important for growth, which is not possible, which is lacking in many countries, is of course the demand is enormous uh, on a global scale. I told initially that the gaming industry is, is turning towards 100 billion US dollars, which makes it uh, the biggest entertainment industry also. But right now we still have a problem in the Nordics, despite the success, despite the success of finding capital to make these companies grow. But it's changing, and I think the main reason for that, why is it changing, is because the, the global pool of people investing, whether if it's in Silicon Valley or it's other places, they're starting noticing uh, uh, the Nordics and uh, uh, start, when you cross a kind of a threshold, it makes it more attractive to come. So the tide is turning, and I've seen as of late more and more companies getting uh, seeding money, angel investors, but also big investments coming out. Uh, and also I talk about the ecosystem. The ecosystem is uh, not only the, uh, the, the chain uh, of, of uh, things, how things uh, are being tied together, but also in the ecosystem in terms of providing talent, of having skilled workforce, but also the availability uh, of uh, capital, etc., uh, is part of uh, creating what's called uh, uh, the ecosystem. And what has uh, made the uh, Silicon Valley in, in the tech uh, industry still the number one region in the world is because they have this very sophisticated ecosystem. And we started getting it uh, in the Nordics. But also, it has started, and that's also where I will lead into Brazil, the government also in Sweden uh, has started to pay attention to what's going on in the gaming industry and also that the most vibrant and the most dynamic sector of the economy is in the gaming industry. So now the politicians are starting to pay attention and I would say that the gaming industry in the Nordic countries has been able to grow and to prosper despite none support from the government because sometimes I hear it in different parts of the world is that oh but our government they don't understand uh, gaming or they don't think it's culture or they don't think this or they don't want to invest you can do this without your government but I do think that uh, probably in Brazil also over time because it has started changing uh, in the Nordic countries and in particular in Sweden but uh, I think it will also change here in Brazil, once they start to understand that it's more than just shooting people or it's just a waste of time, but the, uh, uh, it's a very dynamic and very important industry that produces more games than just blowing up people, right? That's very apparent. So, six months ago, the Swedish government made a statement, a very important one, and they wrote on their own official webpage stating that computer games are rapid growing export industry and, and the, the background that they had for that stating of course citing dice battlefield minecraft and uh, and really recognizing that the number of games that been sold they made a comparison saying that battlefield is the largest swedish culture export since rock set okay or could have been abba right or something like that
But it's a very interesting change. So on their agenda, they said in June last year that computer games have claimed finally the right place in the Minister for Trade's promotion calendar for 2013. Okay, that's a lot of talk, it's interesting, but it was a significant step. It's a, about recognition, because I think also, hopefully this will, because the government, of course, as uh, somebody that can actively set and stimulate different industries, is very important. And they also say, and I think this is uh, something that I, on my end, will hope to try to spread uh, uh, lessons from the Nordics. I mean, we spent four decades, and this is a part of my core message to you guys here today, is that also you can learn from the Nordic region. Uh, also, the government can learn, because the interesting thing of stimulating something like the gaming industry is also that compared to very traditional industrial companies like the car industry or, or something, it, it takes very, very heavy uh, investments to stimulate that industry. But uh, creative industry or like the gaming industry does really not take that much resources. You can make significant change. And a very uh, good example of that is the Finnish government that provide what's called soft loans. The soft loan is that you, as a startup in the gaming industry in Finland, you can borrow money on, on below market interest rate, so very, very good terms. And you don't have to pay it back within, let's say, three or five years, or you can have a bigger, uh, longer time frame. And then this has start to really pay off uh, in the Finnish gaming industry, and I think that's uh, something that also uh, the government here in Brazil uh, could learn from. Uh, we can talk a lot about, but I think uh, we, I thank you for your patience and that you stick to it. So, but very, very briefly, also, which I think is important for politicians and others, and for you also to see, I mentioned that uh, the gaming industry probably is, is the most rapidly growing industry in, in Sweden. I mean, if you look at Sweden, the economy for the past, uh, this comparable re uh, time period was uh, measly 2.8%. That was how our economy was growing. But if you look at the gaming industry, it was steadily growing 35% each and every year for six years. That's a 600% change. That's something really to pay attention to. And they are. <laughs> Finally. And that's, uh, if you compare that in the gaming industry to the wider economy, uh, the gaming industry, uh, in real rate, it's 12 times the real rate and growth of the economy in Sefa. I mean, that's pretty staggering uh, numbers. So, why am I taking up your precious time listening to this? I didn't come here, even though I'm, I'm excited and I'm very happy uh, not for uh, patriotic reasons, but because I think it's very interesting. Uh, and I think it's very interesting to share this with you, what's going on. So I'm not just here, like I said, to brag about the uh, Swedish uh, and Nordic gaming industry, but like I really want you to walk away from here, is to learn about the lessons and see that it's uh, very possible uh, with very small resources to create awesome games and start making money online and pay attention to this disruptive change. So don't get discouraged. So uh, tonight, start together with your friends and start hacking those and coding and creating those wonderful games. Uh, so I really want to say go Brazil uh, and see the opportunities here. Because we're not talking about creating a car industry or something. I am expecting when I come back here the next six years, that you guys have made a difference. Uh, because really big things can happen also. And you, when you create your startups, you create your games, you are global from day one. And it really, I, I mean, I even have to remind myself almost every day when I work uh, to think big, you know, to think outside of the box and take the opportunity of getting tools online that are for free and then create this. Uh, really great game. So get inspired uh, of what we're doing. That's my message. And I know that you guys can do it. It's already 125 companies here in Brazil. You have a domestic market of 40 million gamers that you can satisfy, satisfy here. But you have a global pool. So uh, 
And interestingly enough, I talked about Paradox Entertainment. They're already starting to work together. I spoke to the Stockholm office today, and they, uh, I said, I know that you're working together with one game developer, but he said, shh, we're actually multiple uh, Brazilian game developers we're working with. And I think that's very interesting how the industries are merging. And I know that there's also uh, a talk in a university here in Sao Paulo tonight. You're going to miss it because you're here. But at least it's good to know uh, that things are happening. So, like I said, I know that you guys have the capacity. I know that you have the talent. So utilize it. And who knows? Maybe the next Minecraft actually will come out of Brazil. So uh, I wish you all a good luck. And thank you so much for uh, uh, bearing with me and stay here all the time. So if you have any questions right now, I am willing to take it. Thank you. More than kind. So um, does anybody have any questions? Take your opportunity right now. Uh, my, uh, I apologize for that my Portuguese is very poor, uh, but I know that uh, they've, uh, we have a translator and somebody that can bring a microphone. So don't be shy. Don't be shy. I'm sure that you have some questions. If you are, yes, OK. Do we have a microphone now? It's always here? Yes? And I will have. I, I hope, from Texas. Okay, okay, fair enough, it's gonna be in English. Take Best it away. Thing. Well, I don't know if you will know to answer this, but one of the best I Swedish games that I found find is Penumbra. Have you played? I'm sorry? Penumbra by Paradox. Yes, yes, sure. And another great game that they made was Amnesia, The Dark Descent. Yeah. And I think that was really an uh, awesome game. But I don't know what happened. Did they sell the name Amnesia as a franchise? Because the second game, Amnesia, A Machine for Pigs, that it was made by another, another studio. Which it year? Do you know which year that was? Uh, because uh, Paradox has a huge uh, catalog. Do you know which year it was produced? Um, uh, the first one? Yeah, the one that you I mentioned. Think it, I think it was in 2012, the first Amnesia. Ah, uh, okay. I, the the second one, the Amnesia Machine for Pigs, was made by uh, the Chinese Room. And they ended up doing a game that lost the answers, the essence of the first Amnesia game. Okay. <laughs> so it, it was quite a shame. Why did they sell it? Why they uh, allowed another studio to do this to the, one of the best uh, horror games in history? Okay. Uh, I think probably somebody from Paradox probably could answer that question much, much better. But I know that... Uh, Paradox, uh, uh, a number of years back, had some financial challenges, but they thankfully been able to turn this great company around. And Paradox, uh, these days, are thriving. They're doing very good, and they're hiring people like crazy. And a lot of these franchise uh, uh, and uh, number of games that they're having, they're still developing them or, or something. So just a particular game, if, if you're really interested in it, you can just uh, add me on Twitter. I will provide my Twitter uh, account later, and I can check it out for you. Uh, I, I don't want to speculate exactly or say something is wrong. I would be embarrassed. I'm sure it will echo all the way back to Stockholm and say, what the hell did you say that? So, m please, more questions. I've been on a plane for a very long time. Yes, okay. Is this uh, Portuguese or? Yeah. Okay, I'm ready. Go ahead. Uh, você falou do da Paradox que está trabalhando com empresas brasileiras também, que eles trabalharam com a Behold Studios que fizeram o Knights of Pen and Paper para celular que outras, que outras empresas também estão fazendo parcerias com estúdios brasileiros que estão trabalhando em conjunto com empresas brasileiras um, It's a good question because the, the information that I got today that I think is a little bit of a uh, inside information, so we'll be a little bit careful about it, is since Paradox themselves seems to be uh, uh, joining up with multiple Brazilian companies, I have a feeling uh, that there, something is going on in the Nordics, that they start seeing an opportunities in Brazil. So I definitely think something is happening, but uh, I wish I could say, okay, it's this company, or DICE is working with that, or is that, but uh, it's something because hopefully I will have a chance not only to come back to Campus Party next year, talk more about other things. Maybe I can bring some developers here, have seminars where we can do other workshops or something really cool stuff. But uh, I definitely, together with some connections that I have here in Brazil, I will definitely investigate this. 
Uh, and there's a lot of things that can be said of, about what's going on in the Nordics and that you can learn. Uh, and if you're interested about it, I will here also give you an opportunity. You can add me on Twitter, it's Gecko Brother. I will also, from time to time, I tweet different things on the gaming industry and esports and uh, lots of things. But uh, I will also post information there because I will uh, soon launch a blog where I will blog about the Nordic gaming industry and I'm sure I will have the opportunity to come back uh, specifically to write a blog post about what's happening between Sweden, the Nordic countries and Brazil. So, uh, I will take that as a challenge. Okay, uh, any more questions? We have one uh, over, uh, okay. We, we'll, we'll get back to you there, okay. Good, more questions. Uh, I like to ask uh, how me, a Brazilian, could immigrate in Swedish? Oh, uh, as long as you uh, have lots of talent, great portfolio, it's not a problem to start applying. Uh, we have very good, uh, uh, actually that's one of the problems for US because it's, uh, it's a problem for them to take in, uh, I, I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, uh, Google and Facebook and others have been uh, quarreling with uh, the government in the US to, to make better rules for people come to come to work. So it's actually quite easy. Uh, to make that possible. So I see no reason why Brazilian developers cannot start applying to these studios. Of course, I'm not trying to snatch you from Brazil. I'm not saying that, but I think also it's a great opportunity to maybe move. Uh, I know you have your family here, but it can be a good opportunity to come work in uh, the Nordic countries and then come back to Brazil, start companies here and start hiring people, stimulate uh, Brazilian uh, economy. So good opportunities. We have people from India or from uh, uh, other South American companies, uh, countries, I'm sorry. Uh, so like I said, Paradox and DICE, they have uh, nationalities from more than 30 countries. And I'm sure already uh, that we have some uh, Brazilian, uh, uh, I, will I will try to find out. <laughs> so more than welcome. Uh, we had, uh, where's the microphone? Oh, you already have it. Is it English or Brazil? Uh, English. Okay, take it away. Um, first, it seems to me that there is a trend there in Sweden because normally in the game industry you have gigantic companies like Ubisoft or EA and they kind of dominate the market with very expensive games and lots of lots of employees. But it appears to me that in Sweden you have uh, a lot of smaller companies like Paradox that found a niche on strategy games and it appears that the market is, uh, how can I say more, equal because there are a lot of small companies working together instead of big ones like Electronic Arts or Ubisoft. So is that indeed a trend there? Oh, it's, it's definitely a trend. Uh, and I know that there was a lot of information, a lot of slides, but uh, one slide uh, in particular showed just a few years back the more traditional uh, companies. Mind you that uh, Ubisoft and EA are uh, owning studios. I mean, uh, Massive Entertainment is a Ubisoft studio. DICE today, uh, even though it resides in Stockholm, is owned by EA, right? So you have those traditional uh, multi -cor big corporations. But you're right. Uh, and that's why it's so interesting to see that a company like Muyang because that's the strength of the scene, and it definitely is a trend, but is it, I think it has be become beyond an initial trend, is that we have such a healthy, broad base of gaming culture that you have a strong independent scene, right? With small developers, bigger developers, but you also have, because I think it's important also to have those AAA games, the big budget games, typically, 10, 20 million dollars budgets. I mean, you have in the Nordics, you have five, six of those games uh, at any time being developed in the studios. Those are very important because the game, uh, uh, the, the guy that formed Muyang, he came out system, okay? So he quit uh, one of the bigger studios, formed his own studio. But he's ranked number one now, right? He's kicking ass with the uh, Ubisoft or EA. Uh, actually last year almost had like 60% of the turnover and there are 28 people, 28 people like I said, it's uh, fascinating and also with good margins and stuff and I think that 
the importance, even though maybe that Muyang is a very out of the blue extreme example, what it definitely does is that it inspires a whole generation of developers, and I think it should inspire you too. Maybe you will not make uh, 200 million US dollars, but it shows that it's possible to break this uh, uh, studio game and you don't need to have millions of dollars to invest uh, in platforms or technology. I mean, you guys know that you can for free today uh, get a small developer's license for free, developing uh, extraordinary powerful uh, tools like Unity, right? So anything is, uh, is possible and also launching your games online and start doing really uh, great stuff. Uh, more questions? More questions? We you had one. English, right? Pretty, okay. Microphone? <laughs> okay, Texas, are you ready now? We have... Uh, okay. Okay, go ahead. É, parabéns pela palestra, primeiramente. Nós temos uma, uma leva de, de modes que vem aparecendo, por exemplo, o Arma veio do... Aliás, o DayZ veio como um mode do Arma, é, uma modificação do jogo original, e logo em seguida ele se tornou um jogo, propriamente. É, como a, a indústria vê isso, e você considera que para pessoas que querem entrar nesse mercado é uma boa forma de entrar, modificando um jogo original, colocando uma, uma, um modo de jogo diferente, por exemplo, oferecendo um modo de jogo diferente? I, I th <laughs> first, thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, yes, definitely, definitely. Remember uh, that uh, one of the most uh, successful games, Counter-Strike, started as a mod. It was a mod to Half-Life. Um, and in my recommendations of, of you, uh, if you want to pursue a career or how to uh, get started uh, while building portfolio, Depending on, I mean, if you want to uh, look for a regular job in a studio, or if you want to go on on your own as an entrepreneur, creating a studio, I definitely think joining the mod scene, working on established things, because you get uh, you know, the engine ready, you don't need to worry about uh, uh, network code or other things. I mean, you can focus on gameplay, you can focus on great ideas, building fun things, because in the end, with all the respect to very fancy uh, graphical engines and stuff, it can be very, very boring games that don't also have good gameplays. And that's, unfortunately, you get lost in all the explosions and stuff, but if you focus on the initials. So yes, I, I uh, very highly recommend to work with uh, uh, mod culture, etc., uh, because it also gives you uh, ne necessar uh, necessi <laughs> necessary, I'm sorry, <laughs> getting tired. Uh, uh, skills and tools to work with and get used to work with uh, in teams and uh, uh, developing things and etc. So it's a, it's a perfect way. A lot of game developers. Uh, and remember some of these studios also uh, as, a, as a parallel I think the mod scene is very close to uh, more old school uh, the demo scene, right? You made the demos uh, which uh, laid the foundation for companies like DICE and Rovio etc. So uh, uh, definitely more scenes as well. So, great way to go. Uh, okay. More questions? Take your time because uh, I am in no hurry. <laughs> or you, you know everything that there is to know. I'm happy for you. Don't be shy now. Both in English, Portuguese. If you're shy, that's okay too. We'll be around here. So you, you're also uh, free to come and uh, ask me questions personally if you want to. Uh, or you can even uh, add me on Twitter and uh, send questions there. I will be willing to help you guys. Okay, so if there's uh, no more questions. Oh, there is one. Thank you. Uh, English In or English. Portuguese? English. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, to start working at a big company, I need to start becoming the developer first. I need to make games, indie games, to work at DICE, big companies like that? Okay. Um, first of all, I would say that even though uh, the gaming industry is, as a creative industry still gives them an opportunity, for instance, to be self-taught or you build your own games, you're doing your modifications, etc. But when it comes to a studio like uh, a DICE, especially if you would you know, want to join the team of uh, Battlefront, the next uh, Star Wars game, 
It's like 400 people uh, in very specific skilled uh, 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 expertise working on those games. It's highly trained, highly skilled. And I would say it's joining a team like that, you will have to be top notch uh, to uh, write themselves on their homepage. Do you have what it takes? Sounds almost like military recruitment, right? So that will be probably a dream uh, job to land. A very hard competition. It's thousands uh, of developers and coders around the world applying for those things. But having said that, uh, given how much talent you have, of course in the future it definitely will not be a problem. But I think what you're hinting on yourself is probably that if you don't have a very impressive resume and a lot of you know, AAA titles before that, the indie way or uh, you know, working with mods or other ways of getting your way into the future, uh, I mean, into the industry. I don't know if you, are you still kind of in the uh, pre-career? I mean, you're not, you're not professionally yet working in the industry? Okay, so my advice to you would be to uh, develop your skills and uh, like I said, work with the portfolio uh, and, and uh, trying to uh, maybe here in Brazil, uh, get an internship if uh, you're a certain age you can come because my parallel because uh, since uh, especially the bigger studios if you want to work there due to the fact that they're so specialized creative industries and uh, imagine going back to the Atari or when the Steve Jobs were doing games etc back in the days it didn't take much knowledge you could get into a gaming company or uh, when I started out in the music industry, you could basically start at the bottom of the company, cooking coffee, doing more, you know, benign basic things, and then become more and more uh, advanced, and then uh, become one of the producers in the future. But I uh, find that uh, actually more and more rare, just for the fact that it's so uh, uh, highly skilled uh, games that you need a lot of experience to work on these things. So depending, of course, uh, are you more on the, the coding part of it or are you more graphics or where on the spectrum are you? Uh, coding, okay. So if so, you're in the university right now? Are you uh, studying like, uh, okay. Are you like a computer science? Computer or? engineering. Okay, so you have a kind of very strong foundation. Are you also complementing with math? Yes. Okay, so I would say that you probably, uh, without knowing you too much, but let's assume that then you're having uh, a very good foundation and a good uh, uh, training. Maybe the optimum would have been that in here in Brazil, that you would have uh, been able to go as a post-university level, building on top of that even more university tailored towards uh, a game. We have lots of schools and incubators and uh, universities in the Nordics that are providing that. So if you don't have that, here in Brazil, and you have the resources, you can also apply and go to some of these, uh, get that uh, highly skilled training. Uh, I very, very much recommend that. But uh, don't despair. You have many, many opportunities to break into the industry. But probably, like uh, I think you recognize, a good way is to go through the industry scene, etc. And But just keep fighting, and uh, like I said in the beginning also, keep that passion going, you know. <laughs> Thank you. So good luck, yeah. Okay? Anything else? I was about to wrap uh, uh, up, and then when I was just going to say thank you, goodbye, there came a question. So, still anybody? Uh, if you already asked, I can. Uh, you, if you have another question, I'm fine to answer that too. Uh, also, do you want to ask a question? Or yes. Oh yes. Okay, we have a question here. Will it be in English or in, in Brazil, uh, Portuguese? Portuguese, okay, fine. Here. Gentleman in the middle there with the hat. Yes. É, se você tem algum contato para nós mantermos ou até mesmo enviar os, o portfólio além daquele site que você colocou na o contato seu. Contato direto. Uh, I mean, first of all, I think overall, yeah, yes, of course, you recognize that you have these websites online. You also uh, my suggestion before I answer your question, uh, is, okay. <laughs> okay, he, he, he wants to, 
Elaborate, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, can we get help with the microphone? It seems to... Okay, maybe it uh, checked out. <laughs> Technology always, always gives you... Hello. Okay. Uh, designer portfolio. Portfolio 3D. Designer. Graphics. Yeah. Graphics. Uh, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I understand that you personally have a specific... I just... I will get you to, to answer that, but I just want to kind of just a little bit elaborate on that. Remember that all the studios, whether if they're Nordic or somewhere else in the world, you can go regularly to them on the section of jobs and they uh, post what they're looking for. Okay? So that's a general one. To ask your uh, specific questions, yes, I have personal contacts within the studios. Um, typically, depending on because you can imagine like Paradox or Massive or Dice, they get tons of applications. So uh, even if I am buddy-buddy with the guy that owns the studio, runs it, usually they say, David, send it to the HR. It's because they filter. Um, but uh, uh, send me your portfolio and I will have a look and I can see what I can do. So just add me there and just say, hi, I'm the guy with the cap and you know, uh, hell, I'm an entre entrepreneur myself, and I'm always looking for talent, so give it your best shot. Okay. So that uh, goes with anybody of you here. Send me your stuff and uh, see what you have. That's fine. Uh, it, uh, but uh, if it takes uh, maybe one or two weeks for me to uh, reply, it might be because I'm traveling, etc. So uh, don't take it as uh, uh, th that I ignore you, okay? So send, send me your stuff. Okay. Okay, we have to stop. They're kicking me off the stage. So at any times, uh, if you like what you heard, please uh, write about it online and uh, I will uh, do my best to come here next year because I like to get out of Sweden because it's so damn cold and dark and come here and we can do fun stuff together and explore more opportunities. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here and to share all this and I hopefully I gave... Uh, I reached my goals and gave you some inspiration uh, and gave you an opportunity. So go out there and create and get the next uh, Minecraft coming out of Brazil, okay? Thank you so much. <laughs>